great to be here today. It's great to have you in the room with us. It's great to have you online with us. And it's, it's great to have friends in the room and family in the room and strangers in the room and, and friends and family, strangers online. But how many of you have a neighbor at WBC? Somebody at WBC is your actual neighbor. Yep, a few of you, several of you. Well, for those of you that don't have a neighbor at WBC, I want to show you a guy that actually wants to be your neighbor, right? You know this guy? How many of you know this guy? Yeah, yeah, a few, a few of you, a few of you. I got a lot of blank stares this week when I asked people about Mr. Rogers, that you don't know Mr. Rogers. He was back in the 1960s, but hey, you're probably going to know this guy who actually pinched Mr. Rogers' theme song. His name is Daniel Tiger, and it's went from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood to Daniel Tiger's neighborhood. Now, I don't know if Mr. Rogers endorsed that or not, but uh, you're probably more familiar with that. But their, their, their favorite line was, won't you be my neighbor? neighbor? Neighbor. And now, if none of that makes any sense to you, you probably really relate to this one, right? <laughs> now, I've never seen an episode of that, I can proudly say, I think. I, don't, I have no idea what it's about other than it was the longest running uh, series drama in Australian history, apparently, and it's in the Logie Hall of Fame or something. Uh, I've just read all that on Wikipedia, so I, so I don't know for, for sure, but you can relate. And somehow, society thinks that neighbors are an important thing and that we should have neighbors, maybe know our neighbors, and all of that. Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, what in the world does neighbors have to do with church and all that we're doing? I'm glad you asked, because we are wrapping up a message series today that had neighbors as a launching pad. Jesus' statement in the book of Matthew, Matthew was one of his disciples who wrote about his interactions with Jesus, and Jesus said this. He says, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that was the basis or the impetus for the series that we've been in. And so far in this series, we've covered the fact that we were made for community, and we made a, a big deal about our life groups, and you can still sign up to get into life groups. Pastor N.A.K. would love to connect you. Then we talked about how we relate as family, and we realized that family actually goes well beyond our nuclear family and what we thought. And then uh, Pastor Deanna talked about our friends and how we live together with friends. And then last week, we looked at how we live with and love our enemies, and if you missed any of those messages, certainly you can go to our website and our social medias and everything, and you can catch up. If you try very hard at all, you'll find it, and you can get up to speed. But today, to understand what it looks like to love your neighbor, we're going to examine what I believe is the, the most well-known parable in the Gospels. Now, a parable is a story that Jesus used, that's the way he taught most of the time, to emphasize a point, to bring home a point and help it be relatable to the person he was talking to. Now in Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, we have that one of those stories and it's commonly referred to as the Good Samaritan. Anybody ever heard about the Good Samaritan? Now whether you are a church person or not, whether you're a follower of Jesus, whether you've ever read the Bible, you've heard about the concept of a Good Samaritan. We call people Good Samaritans because they're heroes in our community and society who go out of their way to do a good thing for someone else, right? So we've all heard those stories, even if you haven't been in church before, you've heard about the Good Samaritan. For those already familiar with this story, where we're going to look at the origin of it, I want you to lean in today. I want you to listen close because it's a very familiar story, and a lot of times when things are familiar, we just skim right past them. But I am just guessing that no matter how familiar you are with this today, you're going to find something that you've never heard before. There's going to be something new there for you. I really believe that today. So let's just jump right in. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, setting the context up. It says, one day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? That is a really good question, right? And I would love it if people came up to me all the time and said, hey, 
Pastor Sam, what should I do to inherit eternal life? I can just imagine the conversation from there, and I would just get going and probably never stop. But it was a good question, sort of, because the lawyer, the, the expert in religious law, is testing Jesus. It's not necessarily a hostile testing. We're not sure exactly what his motive was here. It could have been to trip him up, but it also could have been just trying to verify that Jesus as a rabbi was actually the real thing, that he actually knew what he was talking about. So it's not a bad thing necessarily that he was asking this kind uh, of question. And we need to understand that because when people ask us questions, even uh, about our faith or religion or about our church, about Jesus, We don't need to be intimidated by questions because smart people will ask questions, and that's actually not a bad thing on their road to discovery. But this question, what should I do to inherit eternal life, actually has a contradiction inside of it. I'm not sure if you picked that up or not, but there's a contradiction. What does someone do to inherit something? Nothing. Nothing. Front row. You're great. You're awesome. Nothing. Inheriting something uh, is, is you're getting something that someone else earned. Someone else did something to earn stuff. And based on usually based on relationship, not performance, you receive the inheritance. It's a gift. So the expert in the law saying, what should I do to inherit There's actually a contradiction there. And again, if he's asking me that, I'm picking up on that. And that's my launching pad. And I'm going to say, you don't have to do anything. It's a free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ and and, and on and on and on. And really hammering the fact that he doesn't have to do anything. But he's asking, what do I need to do? And Jesus is a much better teacher than I am. Really, I promise you. And he answered the question with a question. He said this. What does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. Now, does this this sound familiar? That's the same thing Jesus said in the book of Matthew that we talked about, we started this series with, but it was also in the Old Testament. So the lawyer knew the right answers, and he gave Jesus the right answers. Then Jesus said, you're right. Do this and live. Now, some people have taken this passage to task and essentially taken Jesus to task, saying, hang on a minute, Jesus is contradicting salvation by grace through faith in this statement, by telling him he's right, that there's something you could do, love God and love your neighbor. But if you look at James chapter two, you'll realize that it's not a condition of faith, but it's an outworking of faith, that we will love God and love people when we have salvation. Charles Spurgeon said it like this, the love of our neighbor is not a condition of salvation, but a fruit of it. Now, a question to stretch your thinking here, if that one wasn't enough. The question is, was Jesus really expecting him to do that and live? Was he really expecting the lawyer, the expert in religious law, to actually be able to do that and live? Was that what Jesus was getting at? Can anyone truly love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself? Loving God Heart, soul, mind, and strength means to desire him above everything all the time. Anybody able to check that box? Everything in you. And love your neighbor as yourself, caring for others and meeting their needs with the same intentionality and care that you do for yourself. Can anybody tick that box? As I reflected on this passage today, or this week, this is a very common thing. We tell people, we just love God, love people. That's the summary of all the commandments. And that's what Jesus was teaching. But I would suggest to you that Jesus, in that statement, was creating an impossible task. He was showing the impossibility. We know it was impossible uh, for them to keep the 600 and something different laws in the Jewish law. 
But I would suggest to you, Jesus is still setting the bar that same level, uh, that same height, that it is not possible. And I think the lawyer understood that with his next statement. Look at what the lawyer said next. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? See, the lawyer understood that there is no way he was going to be able to do what Jesus just said and live. But he wanted to justify his actions or justify himself, literally. He wanted to earn it. He wanted to earn eternal life. So he says to Jesus, who is my neighbor? He's trying to lower the bar, okay? He's actually looking for loopholes. Anybody look for loopholes when somebody tells you to do something or asks you to do something? Yes, we all do. We all want to find the, find the way I can get around that law or whatever, right? No? Is it just me? Yeah. No, I don't think so. So he's asking for clarity. How can I make this achievable? That's what the question really was. Now, a better response would have been for him to say, hey, how in the world can I do this? I need help. There's no way I'm going to be able to live up to what you just said for me to inherit eternal life. That would have been an honest response. But he's trying to move the focus off of himself. So he says, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus goes on to answer with a surprising story. He says, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. He was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. So we're setting the, 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 the story's beginning here. And we notice that it's significant. He says it's a Jewish man. That is significant to the story. We're going to circle back to that in the end. He was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. That's about 30 kilometers, and it was a very dangerous road. Some have said that road was referred to as the road of blood. This man was truly a victim of a crime. We hear a lot of victim language in the world today and in society, and everybody ends up trying to be a victim at some point. But this guy was truly a victim. And we have victims in our world today. If you want to try to relate to, to this guy's uh, plight here, there are people in our world who suffer atrocities that they did not bring upon themselves all around our world. There's human trafficking that's rampant in our world all around. There's places in the world with oppressive governments where people can't get the things they need, med medicine and things like that, and, and just food and water because the governments are corrupt. There's poverty and disease and human suffering that could be relieved if it wasn't for the selfishness and sinfulness of people. These things should grab our attention. They should grip our hearts. And often they do. One way that we actually as a church try to uh, come around some of this is we, we try to help uh, stop human trafficking through something we call the Pong. And you've heard about that the last couple of weeks. It's happening this Friday night. Uh, some people will play ping pong and they're sponsored to do that to give money to people who are trying to relieve human trafficking in parts of Asia. And if you want more information about that, see one of the blue shirts afterwards and they can point you to that. And let's go back to Jesus' story. We've got a Jewish man. He's been robbed, he's been beaten, and pretty much left for dead. Then it says, by chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. So we have a, a priest and the temple assistant. It's also referred to as a Levite in other translations, and I was so resisting the temptation to create a story about a priest, Levite, and a Samaritan walking into a bar. But anyway, so it says the priest and the temple assistant, the priest and the Levite, both of them saw the situation. The priest saw it and went to the other side of the road and kept walking. Couldn't be bothered. The temple assistant or the Levite walked over and he looked. He looked a little bit closer, but he still crossed over and walked by on the other side. What would be your expectation of a priest and a Levite who sees a man in that condition? I would suggest my expectation would have been that when you know something, you're responsible. That when you saw that, the right response is not to walk by on the other side. In our context, you might say that the priest and the Levite or the temple assistant would have been our pastors, our elders, our church council, our ministry leaders. 
those types of people, what would you expect of those types of people? You probably expect them to do more than walk by on the other side. So why didn't these guys stop? Why did they choose to ignore the situation? Several reasons. One possibility was contamination. See, if they touched the man and the man was dead, that would render them unclean. They would not be able to go on about their religious duties if they touched this man and he was actually dead or even if they got blood on themselves from him. That would make them unclean by the, the law. But this would have created a dilemma, as all laws do, because there's going to be a wrestle here because the law also clearly required not only helping people who were in distress, but even animals. Look at a couple of these passages from the law. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 4. It says, if you see that your neighbor's donkey or ox has collapsed on the road, do not look the other way. Go and help your neighbor get it back on its feet. Hmm. Okay. Well, the, the man that just got robbed and beaten up is not an ox or a donkey. Okay. So maybe they can... They can apply this that way, yeah. Well, look, look at Exodus, Exodus chapter 23. If you come upon your enemy's ox, okay, not just your neighbor, but your enemy or donkey that is straight away, take it back to its owner. If you see that the donkey of someone who hates you has collapsed under its load, do not walk by. Instead, stop and help. All right, so now we're not just talking about neighbors. We're talking about people that hate you. Since the decent thing is still to stop and help. Now, we're still talking about animals. So is this guy's life probably not worth as much as the animals, right? Will we say that? Well, let's look at what Isaiah says about this. Isaiah chapter 58 says, Share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. I think the loopholes are all pretty much closed. And what the priest and the uh, Levite would have to, they would have had to have done a wrestle here. The law says, yes, if you touch a dead body, you're, you're unclean and you're not going to be able to serve in the temple and do your, your job. But the law also says, help people. They had to make a decision and they chose to, to potentially go with the other one to avoid possible contamination. Other reasons that they legitimately may have decided not to stop fear for their own safety. They may have been afraid for their own well-being. It could be that the robbers were still around. And it could be that they would be in danger if uh, they didn't move by quickly. And then finally, maybe their schedule just wouldn't allow it. We are doing good stuff, and this would distract us. And we, we've, uh, uh, this, this situation is going to be complicated. It's going to be messy. And I know as soon as I stop, it's going to take a whole lot more time than I've got. So they left it for someone else to worry about. Maybe they just didn't want to get their hands dirty. We really don't have a, a clear reason, but all of those are possibilities. But for whatever reason, they left the man without any offer of help. Then the story goes on. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. A despised Samaritan. You need to understand the relationship between Jews and Samaritan. It was not a healthy one. Jews hated Samaritans. This is the last person you would be expecting to stop and help. And that's why I told you in the beginning this was very significant that it was a Jewish man that had been injured, had been robbed, had been beaten. Jews hated Samaritans. They saw them as half-breeds. There was racial injustice here. They would have seen themselves as superior. And in turn, the Samaritans hated the Jews back because, hey, if you're going to hate me, I'm going to hate you was the response. Even Jesus' disciples in Luke chapter 9 asked Jesus one day, hey, do you want us to pray fire down from heaven on Samaria? When the religious leaders wanted to insult Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 48, they called him a Samaritan and a devil. They equated those two and used that as a condemnation of Jesus. So that is the guy we're talking about. But it says that he had compassion. Compassion means to be deeply moved, to have mercy, to alleviate. See, compassion is more than pity. It's easy for us to have pity and feel sorry for people. But compassion moves 
someone to action. It's the same word that Jesus used uh, when he looked down at the multitudes and called them sheep without shepherd. He had compassion on them. So what did that look like? Well, it looked like soothing wounds, but it also looked like this. He put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I am here. So he's bandaged up the wounds, and now the wounded man is too weak to walk, so he puts him on his own donkey, which by implication means he's going to be walking now down this dangerous road still. And then he took them to a hotel. The Samaritan didn't stop with just bringing him the man to safety, though. He didn't stop by just getting him to the hotel saying, okay, now he's not in the road and everything, and I've bandaged him up. Somebody else can take care of it. It says he took care of him. And then he went to the innkeeper. He spent his own money. Some estimates would say that those two silver coins were for about two months lodging. So it could have been a long time he was paying for it. And then he said, and I'll give you more if you need it when you come back. He did more than the minimum. He did all that he could. Now, this was not a Jew helping a Samaritan. The story would be very different if it was. It is a Samaritan helping a Jew who had been ignored by his fellow Jewish people. That is so important to understand. See, the Samaritan loved those who hated him. He risked his own life and he spent his own money. The priest and the Levite had their excuses. The Samaritan could have as well. But he allowed the pain and the suffering of someone else to stop him from pursuing his own agenda and his own purposes and be interrupted to help relieve the pain of someone else. So then Jesus ends this story to wrap it up by asking another question. Which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who who was attacked by bandits? Jesus said, the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Who was a neighbor to the man? That is a remarkable question. The expert in the law had asked Jesus this question, who is my neighbor? Jesus flipped it and he said this, who can I be a neighbor to? Do you see the difference in those two questions? It's not who's my neighbor, it's who can I be a neighbor to? See, the first question, who is my neighbor, is exclusive. It's limiting. It says, who do I need to go and do good stuff to? Whereas the second question, who can I be a neighbor to, is inclusive. It includes everyone. It means I can go and find someone to be a neighbor to rather than trying to limit and have healthy boundaries so that I don't get interrupted and distracted and have to mess with any complicated, dirty stuff. It sets those boundaries. You know, the lawyer... When he answered Jesus, when Jesus said, which of the three, he didn't say the priest, he didn't say the Levite or temple assistant, and he didn't even say the Samaritan. He couldn't even use the word. He said the one who did good, the one who helped him. He was struggling at this moment. See, Jesus is teaching that loving your neighbor means being willing to inconvenience yourself, to risk your own safety, to bear the cost For anyone who's in need, even your enemy. The lawyer wanted to make the issue complex and philosophical, but Jesus Jesus made it simple and practical. Jesus moved it from duty of love, duty to love, from debating to actually doing something. You know, perspective is an interesting thing. As we look at this this man who was attacked. The thieves saw the man as a victim to exploit, so they attacked him. The priest and the Levite saw him as a nuisance to avoid, so they ignored him. The Samaritan saw him as a neighbor to love and help, so he took care of him. So if we stopped right there today, I think Jesus' teaching would be very instructive and helpful. Go and do good to people. But here's the twist that I told you to hang out for if you're familiar with the story. I think Jesus wanted to be more than instructive here. I think Jesus' message to that lawyer that day was to be transformative for him. 
And I think that's what he means for us today. And uh, stay with me here. Who do you think in this parable Jesus wanted the lawyer to identify with? Who do you think he wanted us to identify with? Do you, do you think he wanted us and the lawyer to identify with the bandits? If that's you, stop it, okay? I don't think Jesus wanted us to see ourselves as the bandits. We, we, we don't want to be the bandits. Do you think he wanted us to see ourselves as the priest or the Levite? Well, sadly, often we may see ourselves that way. I'm not sure that's what Jesus' point was. All of us want to see ourselves as the Samaritan, right? We want to be the hero of the story. The Samaritan is the hero of the story. And we would believe that Jesus was saying, hey, go be like the Samaritan. I'm going to suggest to you today that Jesus had something different in mind. Jesus did not expect us to identify with the priest or the Levite or the Samaritan, but with the man bleeding in the road. That was Jesus' point. You are the one bleeding in the road. You are not the Samaritan. See, the one he's talking to here is a Jew. He was one of their own. And the point that Jesus was trying to help him understand is that his religious system and structures, his religious leaders were not able or willing to help him. But that someone who owed him nothing, who would have seen him as an enemy, enemy showed mercy and compassion on him. That, I believe, friends, is what Jesus wanted him to understand. So then the story becomes about what happens when you're desperate, when you're hopeless, and someone who owes you nothing sacrifices himself for you as an act of mercy and grace. He would have been saying to the lawyer, you are not the Samaritan. You're the man lying there who has been beaten and bruised and you're close to death. And your only hope for survival is an act of grace and mercy from someone who owes you nothing. That was Jesus' message to the lawyer that day. And this is your story too and my story too. You see, we are not the Samaritan. We are like the man who was on the road, beaten and bruised by our sin and left for dead. But Jesus didn't want to leave us there. Jesus had mercy on us. See, Jesus is the Samaritan in the story. He is the one who was despised and rejected and was the enemy of the one who was hurting even, but was willing to help. See, Jesus did not just inconvenience himself. He left heaven to come to earth for you and I to suffer and die on a cross. He was not willing just to risk his own safety. He laid down his life dying in our place, paying a debt that you and I owed for our sins instead of making us pay it. He was willing to bear an enormous cost, not just financial, but the wrath of God the Father on human sin. For us when we were his enemies. See, that's what Jesus was talking about here. And friend, we need to see ourselves today as that traveler on the road who was desperate, who was hopeless. See, when we see ourselves in need as desperate, then we will accept the mercy and grace that someone who doesn't owe us anything but wants to give us everything has to offer you know, what, what, what if in the story there was another twist? What if the, the Jewish man who had been beaten had said no to the Samaritan? Hey, no, no, I got this. You're, you're my enemy. You know, I don't need your help. He'd have laid there and died in the road, hopeless still. See, today, some of you in this room and online, you may need to say yes to Jesus. You may feel hopeless and you may be desperate we have to get to that place at some point in our life. But the question I would ask you, has there ever been a time where, when, you, when you realized you were that man that you, you, or woman and you said, Jesus, I give you my life. I accept what you want to do for me. Some of you need to do that today. If you've never done that, I want to invite you to do that today before you leave this building. Come talk to someone at the end of the service up front. There'll be people waiting to talk to you about that. But Jesus was a master at using stories to get the point across. And instead of telling a story that had a moralistic ending that would inspire us to just go and be like the Samaritan and do good, 
He tells a story in such a way that we can identify with a man bleeding and desperate on the road, dying in a need of mercy, recognizing that that is who you are and I am, gives us the power to transform us to a place so we can actually love our neighbor then. See, now and only now, if we identify as that person who was rescued by Jesus, can we apply the moralistic lesson to go and love like Jesus? Not in order to, to gain his approval, not out of guilt or fear or shame, but because you have been loved, because you've been saved, and because you have eternal life. Now, go and do like Jesus. Go and love like he has loved you. Be willing to inconvenience yourself. Be willing to risk your own safety. Be willing to bear the cost of someone else in need. And their greatest need is for you to share the same love that you've experienced. Father, thank you so much for today. Lord, I thank you for this, this story that's so familiar. But Lord, has so much depth and meaning for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see ourselves the way you see us. Lord, you see us as people who were desperate and hopeless, needing a Savior. But Lord, for those of us that have put our faith and trust in Jesus, Lord, you see us as forgiven. Lord, thank you for that. And now, Lord, as we have been forgiven, help us to go and to show love and show mercy and show grace and kindness to other people. But, Lord, help us do that from a place of understanding our own brokenness and the depth of our need. Thank you for this story that Jesus told. And help us to go away and do the same thing. In Jesus' name. Thank you.